Hello everyone, thanks so much for attending. My name is Jan Franke and welcome to Geolytics. I'd like to start off today by telling you a little bit about myself and how Geolytics came about. Now, I've been involved with the GPR industry since the late 1980s, so for about 30 years, and I specialize in low frequency applications for the mining industry. Over the past decades, I've had the opportunity to work with GPR in over 100 countries in every possible environment. What excites me about our technology is its uniqueness in, in comparison to other geophysical methods in terms of how broad our applications are. I mean, just think, the same technology that we use to detect pipes in the ground or rebar in walls is being used to image ice sheets in Antarctica kilometers deep or tumors in the human body only millimeters in diameter. What's also really exciting is the rate that this technology has progressed just over the last few years. You know, what started out as this niche kind of method for archaeologists and glaciologists using massive electrostatic plotters mounted in the back of vans has grown into this global industry with tens of thousands of users spanning pretty much every country in the globe. And those, those old analog recording devices have now been replaced by massive multi-channel systems producing gigabytes of data every hour. Whilst hardware has advanced dramatically over the last three decades, what hasn't really kept pace is the software to process all that GPR data. Now, of course, every manufacturer produces their own software to analyze data from their specific instrument. And there are packages out there which read data from any instrument and have very advanced functions. But when dealing with modern array data sets and even larger single channel grids, these existing solutions may be somewhat limited. What was needed was a very powerful yet intuitive way of analyzing data sets from any radar system of any size. And that's why after years of hard work, designing, coding, testing, back to coding, back to testing, and working with dozens of users from around the globe, we finally released Geolytics. Now, we believe Geolytics is the future of GPR processing with all the functions and calculations performed in the cloud using the power of parallel computing but accessed from a simple web browser. And Geolytics is never going to be a finished product. We're continually adding features based on users' needs and we'll eventually be bringing in and processing other geophysical data sets to make it kind of a central studio for near-surface geophysics. And of course, we rely on your feedback from users like you to direct our next features. So rather than relying on maybe four or eight cores on your PC, we're able to harness the power of a farm of processors all built around a very intuitive flow path and at a fraction of the cost of existing solutions. Indeed, price has been really carefully designed to allow even casual GPR users who may only have one or two projects a year to purchase access for a single month at a very low cost. So Geolytics has been designed really from the ground up to be this highly intuitive uh, system with a simple wor workflow starting from a drag and drop interface to load in files from any GPR system to positioning those files using either GPS track surveys or a traditional grid and then processing those profiles with functions raising, ranging from simple gains and filters to much more complex methods of even t mapping check textural variations. The user may then interpret the data manually or using machine learning driven AI algorithms to automatically detect hyperbolas and horizons. And then from there, the user can create slices, surfaces, and we can map amplitudes of rebar, etc. And we can spit all that out into images, georeference maps, Google Earth overlays, or AutoCAD DXF files. So it's a very flexible system. Now, doing things in the cloud isn't just about being like everyone else who is putting software in the cloud. There are distinct advantages. And aside from the blistering processing speed where we're able to fine tune all the settings and all the processing functions and see the effects live on the screen. You see, once the data is in the cloud, it can be shared. So you can collaborate with colleagues on any of your projects wherever they are in the world. And in the future, you'll be able to share your output maps and 3D models with clients. Geolytics and cloud processing also serves the data repository for your historical projects, enable you to access them immediately from any web browser. 
So as with any cloud processing platform, concerns about data security are always raised. And we've spent a lot of time studying this and making sure we get this right. We have detailed all this in our terms and conditions, but we've emulated similar geospatial cloud processing providers. Geolytics does not own any of your data and we never access your project files. The files remain on servers based on the same platforms as used by many multinational corporations. Your files are also fully encrypted on these servers and we use the exact same technology you use every day for online banking. And by the way, for our European listeners, we are fully European GDPR compliant. So today, I'd like to take you through a very simple project as an introduction to the power of cloud processing for geophysical data. Of course, we'll be taking questions right after this presentation, so feel free to start writing them in the chat box as you think of them. Um, you will also notice a code which should appear on your screen. This link will give you, I think, a 25% discount on any subscription if you sign up over the next 24 hours. So in this webinar, which we're calling Geolytics 101, we'll be working with a very simple grid data set using GSSI data, which is being provided by our friends at Concrete GPR in Oregon, USA. Now for the sake of brevity, I've uploaded most of the data. Now, some of you might be concerned about upload speed. So let me just take a look at this project we've created here. These are all the files I've already uploaded. And you can see that we're using a 10 megabit connection for uploads and each file is parallel upload so we're seeing about three to six seconds per file and in this case each file is about three megabytes so it's a very very fast upload speed for most internet connections in fact I'll show you how the upload works I'm going to take the last few files and drag and drop them into the interface now the, the system is designed so that it automatically recognizes this GSSI data. It doesn't have any GPS data associated with, so it is a grid format uh, project. And it'll load all of these in. If you have a large number of them, you can have the software play a chime when the uploading is complete. So you saw how quickly that went. And these are our last few files, which we just uploaded at a couple seconds for each one. So now we have our, all our files ready to go. Let's go ahead and take a look at them. Well, firstly, we have files. We happen to know these are in one direction. So to show you how this works, we will create a folder called the X direction. You can call it whatever you want. And we will take all of our files and move them into our folder. If we had ortho orthogonal files in the Y direction, I would create another folder and put those uh, files into the Y direction folder. It's important to do that if you have bi-directional grids because then it allows you to position each grid accordingly to their angle. So let's go into the positioning tab. What we see here is, well, nothing at all. And that's because we haven't declared anything at all about these files. So we'll go into the X directory here and the first thing we need to declare is what is a trace separation? Now, we're working in meters, but of course this was acquired in the United States, so we'll, we'll work in inches, I suppose. And our trace separation, now we could have been told what the trace separation is, or in the case of most radar uh, data sets, uh, there'll be an in embedded trace separation in the data file itself. So we're going to believe that the embedded trace separation is correct and apply that one to all the data sets. We now see that we have one single profile that goes upwards. And the color code is very simple. It's all profiles start at green and end at red. So the profile direction is green to red, green for start, red to end. When we look at our embedded trace separation, we see that we have a separation multiplier. Now this is for situations where you may not have a highly accurate odometer. So you might want to increase or decrease the scaling of that odometer tick rate. You can also force the uh, profile length to a specific length. So if we happen to know it's 30 feet long, we'll force every profile to 30 feet, regardless of how many traces there are. We might have the information on trace density. That is, I have 30 traces per foot. We can enter that, or we can use marker positions, which is possible on some of the radar systems. In this case, we're going to use the embedded trace separation. We can trim extra data, so if some of our data goes outside a certain limit, uh, say we want all of our profiles to be 
25 feet long. We can trim them off. In this case, we'll leave them. And we do have a line pattern. We were told we have a line pattern. If we didn't, we can have an origin for each point, uh, sorry, for each uh, profile and an angle. But in this case, we have a line pattern. And we know that our origin is at uh, 0, comma 0. It doesn't matter if it's meters or and in this case, these are our x directions, so they are at 90 degrees. Now, the profile separation, this is very important. Firstly, we'll do this in feet. As we are standing on our origin at 0, 0, x and y, and looking down the direction of, of increasing x, our profiles went in increasing y, so they went upwards, so the next profile was one foot to the left. In this case, that would be in a negative direction, right? Going upwards to the left uh, if I was standing on the origin point. So our profile separation is actually negative one foot. And here we go. Here's our grid all laid out. Now again, we're only working with data in one direction here. We also have data that's being co collected in one direction. So the, the acquisition team is walk back and start again at a single starting point. That may not always be the case. We could have a reverse direction in either odd or, or even uh, uh, line numbering. But in this case, we're all starting on the left side and going to the right side. So now we know where everything is. Well, we do in the Cartesian plane, but what if we wanted to place this in real-world coordinates? Now, it just so happens that the team that acquired this data did a GPS survey and collected the base point for the origin, the x, y location. And we also know the angle that this grid was angled in, in real-world coordinates. So we can go up here and say geolocate, and we'll go ahead and type in the coordinates that we were given here, 29, and this is uh, in the United States, so it's Northern Hemisphere, of course, 122. And this is Western Hemisphere here. And we happen to know that this is at 340 degrees. So this is what our grid really looks like in real world coordinates. And when I say real world coordinates, we are working in UTM WGS 84 coordinates. And it's all based off this corner point here. Well, that's nice, but we want to see where this is in the real world. So we can do a couple different options here. We can upload our own imagery if we have geo-referenced um, uh, drone imagery, for example, if we had a drone out on the site and, and collected uh, uh, photogrammetry data while the GPR acquisition was going on, we can upload that. In this case, we don't have that, so we're going to use a satellite uh, map provider. We'll just choose Mapbox. And we can see here, so this seems to be some sort of construction site. We'll assume that those trucks weren't there during the survey. But this, this gives us a kind of a contextual point of where it is. It seems to be um, an industrial sort of construction site. So now we can go ahead and take a look at some of these profiles and start processing them. And this is a very simple process. We can either straight go to the profiles page, or we can literally pick one of these randomly. So let's go ahead and just randomly pick this one here. I double click on it and what we see here is well absolutely nothing well what's going on here it's because we have completely low amplitudes there's nothing really to display on the screen so what we have to do is add some sort of scale to it in this case we'll add a constant scale and what will result is a profile which you're a little bit more used to looking at well our first step is to find or declare where time zero is now, many manufacturers have a time zero correction built into their trace headers. We can use that, but we generally tend to use our own uh, time zero search function. It tends to be a little bit more consistent. So let's go ahead to processing. We'll add a processing step, time manipulation, time zero correction. And there's a, a couple different ways of doing that, but we find that the finding peak seems to be the best. This is a reasonably good uh, mapping of time zero. So what we have here is this is our original profile on the top and our processed version on the bottom. Our next step might be to add a gain because I really can't see anything at depth here. So let's go ahead and add a gain. In this case, I'm going to use an energy decay. We like energy decay because it tends to maintain relative amplitudes. Uh, that's very important if you're doing other types of processing uh, further down the processing chain. 
AGC gains are quite popular, but remember they don't maintain at relative amplitude. So let's do an SEC gain, which is the same as an energy decay. And again, this is the original data. Here's our gained data. And we see, well, we can see some very nice pipes. That's pretty clear. And we see some background horizons. So what's going on here? This is one of two things, uh, or actually three things. It's, it's internal noise within the uh, the instrument itself. There's ringing within the antenna, within the antenna shielding, and of course there could be ground coupling issues. Let's smooth out that gain a little bit. This makes very little difference, but it might give us a little bit nicer gain profile there. So we need to do something about this uh, horizontal banding here. Let's go ahead. There's a couple ways we can get rid of them too. So we can use a 2D FFT. In this case, why don't we make it very simple and we'll add a filter of a background subtraction. So a background subtraction is guessing at a trace width of about, so I guess 100. Yeah, we can change that if we want and we can see the results on the fly. So I don't know, let's, let's go with 130. It makes no, no difference really. Now the next thing I notice about this data set is there's really no useful data, maybe beyond about 34, 35 nanoseconds. So why don't we go ahead and trim the data set down to just 34 nanoseconds, just so you can see how that works. And I can slide that up, well, 36. There we go, now I have my pipes very clearly shown. So this is, this is all we need to do, really. If we wanna go ahead and interpret this, why don't we start doing that? Now, the first thing we wanna do, for, though, is determine what kind of radar velocities we're dealing with here. So we have an estimate velocity tool here under interpretation. Go ahead and click that and place our point about there. Let's try and spread it out so we can see it a bit more. I'm just using the mouse wheel to do that. And let's see if I can get this pretty close. Something like that. I could probably be a bit more careful, but I believe that, sure, 0.08, so reasonably moist, but maybe, uh, maybe some clays in there. Let's go ahead and accept that velocity, and we'll assign that to the entire project. So now we know our velocities. Let's go ahead and start interpreting some things. So we're gonna assume those are pipes, and we'll call them pipes uh, 01, I guess, and these are points. So we can go ahead and go click, 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 and you can see on the, the mini map, it immediately displays where those pipes are. We can then go to the next profile by either pulling this menu down or clicking the next button. And I have hopefully the same three pipes here. Yep, and they do seem to be the same pipes. So they all seem to line up. We're gonna go off, one of them is gonna go off the edge of the screen perhaps, but. Here we go, so we can see this. Now, what we start seeing though, is there's a color code associated with this. And in fact, you can see that here, in this case, and I'm just using the, my mouse scroll wheel, this one's turned up blue. Well, the color code is based on depth, and it's just a rainbow map. And what it enables you to do is very rapidly determine, are you following the right uh, phase and amplitude? Are you following the right pipe? So for example, here, I seem to have well, it seems to be dipping a bit. If I was to lower this down to here, that might give us a green line. But what if, let's say on the next one, I'll get it completely wrong. I'll go here, here, and here. And sure enough, yep, it showed me red. So this is something that's wrong here. I need to go back to this and go, whoops, let's move it back up to here. So the idea is that the color should be gently changing. Of course, pipes aren't always flat, but they're not going to jump up and down every foot. So we should see a gentle change in the color codes as we go along in our mini map. So that's a kind of a neat feature. And that's one way of finding pipes, but that's a pretty long and laborious way of doing it if I had, what, 97 profiles, right? So let's find a better way of doing that. And uh, let's go ahead and actually delete these pipes right now. And let's add a new set of pipes. Let's call these pipes uh, AI for artificial intelligence. And we're going to find some pipes using an automated algorithm. So what this does is uses machine learning to try and match a learned set of pipes. And we fed in thousands of pipes already, thousands of hyperbolas to the, the, the database. And it tries to find 
uh, hyperbolas based on what it thinks hyperbolas should look like at different velocities. Now the problem occurs though when we're looking at, I mean everybody talks about AI and GPR and it's been a buzzword for the last couple of years and there's students trying to do a PhD thesis on it. It's all very well. The problem is that if you're not in concrete, concrete works very well because of course it's pretty homogeneous. But if you're in a real world geology, you have all sorts of other interference. You have geological horizons. You have boulders and cobbles which may look like pipes. So which one is a pipe and which one isn't? And what ends up happening quite often in a real world scenario, not in concrete, is that you end up with a lot of noise in your signal. But maybe that's okay. So let's go ahead and do an auto discover here. And what we have is a threshold value. So right now, hey, this is pretty good. It's found two pipes for us. It's missed this one. So I'm gonna bring that threshold up to oh, 21. Oh, it got the pipe, but it's slightly off. That's okay. Let's see what happens here if we look at the entire profile. See, it's missed a couple here and there as well. If I apply those processes to the entire data set, so what it's doing now is attempting to look through the entire data set at every possible pipe. Let's see what we see on this mini map. And I should also men mention that the mini map is undockable. So this can be placed in a second monitor if you happen to have a two monitor setup. So what the, the software is doing right now using cloud processing is going through every single profile and trying to match up pipes. Now here's our map and boy, we have a lot of noise in there, but if you look carefully, see some pretty clear pipes. So if we wanted to, we can go ahead and interpret those reasonably well if we just ignored some of that noise, right? Or we can go through every profile one by one and correct out or delete out all the noise. But as a very f quick first pass that, hey, show me where the pipes are in this data set, it works pretty well. So in fact, let's go start building some actual point of pipes. These are just points. We want to actually create some three-dimensional point uh, pipes. So we go to assets and we say add a new assets and now we use the same nomenclature as Auto, uh, AutoCAD so we're going to call these polylines um, which is what AutoCAD calls them and confirm and we're going to use the pipes that we found from the uh, automated detection algorithm and today we'll make them purple and yeah 10 centimeter pipes sound realistic so I can go ahead and start clicking, whoops, I zoomed in too far here, but you get the idea. I can click between these points and start drawing out my pipes. Pretty simple way of doing that. So that's one way of detecting pipes. Now, of course, if we're looking for utilities, we could go do some slicing. So let's go ahead and try that as well. We'll delete these polylines. And we go back to our profile tab. Now to do slicing, we have to do a little bit more processing to this data set. The first thing we need to do is migration. And for those of you who are new to GPR processing, very briefly, the concept of migration is to attempt to take all the energy within the hyperbola, within that horseshoe shape, and collapse it into ideally a single point. So let's go ahead and do that. And there's many different ways of doing migration. There's probably half a dozen algorithms we are using essentially a Stolt migration. So we need to tell the computer how wide a window we want to look to collapse all that data down into a single point. We can apply a velocity of one we've already determined. I think it was 0.08, or we can apply our own velocity if we don't believe that. But we'll leave it as 0.08. And the beauty of cloud computing here is that we can actually just use the slider and fine tune exactly what we want. So if we go to Something like that, eh, maybe a bit more. Let's, let's, that's a pretty nice, so that target there has collapsed into this blob here. These ones are collapsed into individual blobs here. Uh, this one might, might, might be able to increase that a little bit. Okay, so we're reasonably happy with this, but the problem now is that we have positive and negative values. So the next step we usually do before slicing is we apply an envelope function. And in our case, we'll be using a Hilbert transform. It's just a fancy way of essentially normalizing all the data into a positive uh, number space. So we apply this Hilbert transform and we should get yep, a nice black blob there. Now here's the beauty of all of this. Um, we can go back at any point in this processing and we can change 
the values back and forth and we can see live what that effect has on the final data set. Right? So any of these can be, we can turn off energy decay and well everything will go away of course. We can turn it back on. If we don't like the order of which we've done things, we can change the order and put time cut first. That shouldn't make a difference, but some things do make a difference. Even better, let's say I'm working on this, uh, this data set and my colleague Mary comes along and she says, oh, I want to have a go at it. Well, we can do that by saying add a new processing group. We can add, uh, well, we'll call it uh, modify name, we'll call it uh, Mary's uh, processing and she can go ahead and start her own processing and do whatever she wants and produce her own data set all based off the same raw data so that's quite useful but the other thing that can be used for which is kind of cool I'll duplicate I'll delete that is that if I'm doing two different types of uh, interpretations for example if I'm looking for hyperbolas but then I also want to do some time slices I can create a new uh, processing group and have the second one for migration to Hilbert transforms because I'm going to do some time slices. So let's go ahead and, and make those, uh, those time slices. So if we go to assets and we say today we're going to do some slicing, so slices uh, 101, and these are indeed slices. Okay, I like grayscale. You have a number of different color schemes to use, but uh, I tend to see that more detail in grayscale. I'm going to use the full color scale from zero to uh, the maximum value, so I'll, I'll put a mirror on there. Um, we'll do a Krieging al algorithm. I should have had this in feet all along. You can assign imperial values to the entire project if you want. So let's say a cell size of, oh, I don't know, 0.5 meters and a search radius of, I guess, about two feet. We'll start at the surface. Let's make a slice every, I don't know, 30, so that's about, okay, 0.1 of a meter. Sorry, I'm mixing up my... Uh... Now, slice thickness is very interesting. Instead of taking a single slice through a voxel, what we can do is take kind of a sandwich, so it's a summed amplitude of all of the values between, uh, between a window. So, for example, if I had a slice at 20 centimeters and have a 10 centimeter slice thickness, it's actually summing the values between 15 centimeters and 25 centimeters. So yeah, let's go ahead and do that at point 0.1. So what's going to happen now, and again, the beauty of cloud computing, is when we're displaying the individual profiles, we're actually applying those processing parameters on the fly. So when you flick to the next profile, it quickly applies all the processing parameters only to that file, and then to the next, and the next, and so on, whichever one is on the screen, because we're trying to be as efficient as possible. Oh happened before I could even speak about it. And what we're doing right now, which happened in six seconds there, was that we're processing all of them together, right? So let's go ahead and see what we see here. Well, zero meters is not much, there's not much. We're starting to see something, oh geez, okay, here we go. So at 0.6, we have a pretty obvious network of pipes here. Um, I think anybody can see that quite clearly. And then if we go any deeper, is the, does it get more exciting? No, that's, that's about it. But certainly at about 0.6 meters or even 0.5 meters, there's some very, very clear pipes. So let's go ahead and, and do something with the, these, right? So we can go um, pipes again. And um, sorry, this is going to be a polyline. Okay, and this time we're going to use our slices. And again, this is all in 3D, so we can go ahead and go to our whatever 0.6 and if we wanted to we can go ahead and create our points along the oops sorry anyway you get the idea and this is all of course 3d aware so if we change our our slice depth and let's let's increase the vertical exaggeration here if we change our slice depth that's where we'll be drawing it so a, a pipe could change depth as it goes along so that's how we create our pipes. Um, let's now go ahead and, and make some outputs of this. So let's start off with, well, we'll just do an aerial view. And I'm going to have my background image because I like my satellite view. And I'm going to add some slices. And again, uh, we're going to use our slices 101 and our, yeah, we're going to stick with grayscale. And I think it was point 
six. That was kind of exciting. There we go. Right, and so that looks really good. And then, uh, well, we can add we can add our polylines. I didn't really draw any in there. Okay, there's our black polyline, um, and we can color uh, code that to whatever color I had chosen, or as a depth scale, and then we can export that as a KMZ file directly into uh, Google Earth. In fact, we should be able to start off uh, start up Google Earth very quickly here and see where that takes us. So the concept behind this is it's a very clear flow path from importing data, getting it positioned correctly using a very simple color code from green to red. So you can run your eye up and down your data set and it looks like where it was supposed to be. And then doing very simple processing but also having the power of hundreds of other processing steps. And well, here's our slices. Where's my, oh, and there's my pipe. Right, so uh, I'm not very good at controlling this. Okay, so I've used the black and whites, it's kind of hard to see. Oh, and apparently it's now a parking lot. Okay, I don't know which image is more recent, but uh, okay. And we can go ahead and change the depth of that to whichever depth we're on. We can, of course, take away the polyline. So you get the idea, it's standard uh, Google um, Earth output. And that can be also output as different file types. So this is what I wanted to show you in Geolytics 101, just the power of uh, a simple processing flow, but having the access to all of these processing features, right? So you can see that we have all the major processing features that you'd ever need, uh, and some that uh, you might not be familiar with. So the texture analysis stuff is very interesting when it comes to looking at geological targets, particularly for railways we've found. Um, trying to differentiate different grain size distribution within the ballast. So we're going to be taking some questions in the next little while and uh, I think uh, our next uh, webinar will be in a couple weeks so we encourage you to tune in for that. Thank you so much for your attention and for um, giving me your time to, uh, to listen to this webinar. Okay, everyone, um, <laughs> just to give you an idea of uh, how quickly our dev team works, as uh, I was reading that out, I was uh, told that, oh, we're not live streaming now, um, yep, I was told that uh, our chat function didn't work, so we decided to roll with our own um, web streaming service uh, online itself uh, within the Geolytics platform, and what I need everybody to do who's watching is just go control R, that is to refresh your uh, your website window, and then you'll be able to enter the, the chat functions uh, and be able to ask any questions that you may have. So if you can all just please go control R, and that'll uh, completely re uh, refresh the window. I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. Great. I think most of you would have been able to do that by now. Do we have any new questions? Uh, Forrest, you've asked about, uh, is the webinar being recorded? Yes, of course it is. Um, it is uh, going to be on YouTube uh, later today. Are there any other questions? Okay, live chat is working, thanks Forrest. Um, so that's good. I apparently have done my job. If uh, there aren't, aren't any other questions, uh, <laughs> the dev team is incredible. Thanks, Reed. Well, you've got, you guys have been amazing in terms of uh, giving us feedback for the last uh, year and a half. Do we offer any classes on processing? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's not a formal sort of thing, but uh, for us, we're happy to work with you at any time. Uh, on processing your data sets. Uh, you know, we've certainly been uh, helping you out for the last couple months, and I think 
we've been able to uh, show you the power of cloud computing. So super happy to work on, on processing with you, or we can add that to a future uh, webinar if you'd like, where we go through, let's say, processing for utilities detection or rebar detection. And the rebar detection is quite interesting because um, you know, being able to now map the amplitude of rebar and thus give you an idea of corrosion levels is something that would have been very, very difficult to do manually in the past. But now with machine learning, uh, it becomes much more streamlined. So, uh, Forrest, you had a, uh, a data set last week, I think, where it took maybe 10 minutes to map out that huge data and show you where the, the corrosion was most prevalent. Ryan, uh, what are the options for importing po post process? Uh, files, uh, for, okay, uh, whoops, um, oh, I see, okay, so, so in other words, bringing in post-process, like, uh, uh, post-process, uh, uh, PPK, uh, corrections, so we haven't built that in yet, but that's something that would be very, very easy to implement. Uh, we would have to have everyone agree on a standard CSV format so that uh, the columns were kind of expected or even have a, a function that you could define which columns which, right? So an easting, northing, and, and sort of whatever other columns we need. And then, of course, have a trace associated with that. And that would overwrite, perhaps, the, the native uh, MALA or GSSI uh, data set. Uh, David Campo, can we assign more than one velocity? So at this time, no, not yet, but that is uh, on a future release that will be happening very shortly. And we understand that uh, that is important, particularly when you're in a, in, a, in a moist environment where you have a slower velocity at depth. So that's something that we will certainly work on. Uh, as you can see, oh, Francisco, yes. So. So in terms of bringing in other geophysical data sets, if we look at the geophysical toolbox and we you know, look at things like EM or ERT or MANG or even gravity, the actual processing behind them, unless you get into serious inversion, and even inversion, there's, there's a few codes out there to use. The actual, this, it's, it's all about display and making voxels and comparing that to what we've done already on, on GPR, the, I think it's going to be much easier to bring in the other types of geophysical data sets. Uh, so I'm not too worried about that. Uh, what is the cost to trial this thing for a couple of weeks? Oh, the cost is massive. It's so big, it's free, right? So we do have a, a simple uh, a tier that has no cost at all. It'll take in small projects. I think the maximum project size is 10 megs. Uh, but it will allow you to upload a reasonable size, small project, a few lines here and there, and give you an idea of the power of, uh, of this platform. So all of that's uh, online, and you can just go to geolytics.com under pricing, and you can see that. And you can sign up absolutely free and have full access to everything. Uh, Tom Grant in the UK, is it possible to import TS position files representative, uh, re retrospectively running formatting to add a timestamp? Not as yet, but again, that's something that we're super happy to uh, work on with you. And uh, if you give us some sample files, we can implement that very quickly. So that's, that doesn't sound like that would be too hard to do at all. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, if there aren't any questions, and if there are, uh, by all means, contact us. Um, Many of you know uh, who I am already, or you can contact us at support at geolytics.com at any time. We'll get back to you. Um, and again, we rely on users like you. So if there are functions that we need to implement, that can be done very quickly and you give us some sample data. We believe that we support pretty much every GPR system out there. There's a couple weird ones uh, or, or less popular ones, I should say. Uh, that we haven't had any sample data from. I know there's a Russian system uh, that we haven't seen sample data from, but basically everyone else has been fine. Uh, will there be ever an offline version? <sighs> Probably not right now, because the whole point of this is the power of cloud computing, right? So instead of just processing one profile at a time, we're able to do 
100 profiles all at the same time. So, so that's what the whole system was built around. Now, I do understand that there are going to be needs for uh, people to, to operate in remote field conditions where there's no LTE connection or they just can't get data up uh, to the cloud, in which case, yeah, maybe in the future, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this, Ryan, uh, if there is a need and uh, we could build a, uh, a simplified version, maybe just more as a viewer to do some very simple um, uh, gains and, and filters and a quick slice or something to make it a very simple uh, um, viewing platform, essentially, with then a button perhaps that uploads it directly to, uh, to your account in the cloud once you get back to Wi-Fi coverage. Uh, okay, how easy is it to share a project with colleagues and collaborate? Well, let's go and do that right now. Uh, so I can go to stop, I should be live right now. And uh, so I'm back at my project here and I can go to my home screen and this is uh, my, my project. It was called uh, Glytics 101. I'm gonna go ahead and share that with my friend right now. If I can spell, confirm, and that is done. So now he's working on it as well. Um, and um, he can create his own processing, he can modify mine, he can delete everything I've done, um, or he can start again. So it's very, very easy to share with colleagues uh, to collaborate anywhere in the world. Any other questions? And Adam, to, to follow on that, the next step will be to uh, add, so going back to the output tab, having uh, you uh, able to get, provide your clients with a link that goes directly to that output tab, um, which then they'll be able to manipulate the output in terms of vertical exaggeration or angle, maybe I'll put their own little reports or PDF files, but they can't modify their actual, um, their actual source data, that only you can do. Uh, from Christopher, can you convert UTM to local coordinates within the platform? No, so at, at not yet, right? We had to make a decision to make it as universal as possible. So we just went with uh, UTM WC84, which everyone understands. If currently, if you want to move to a local coordinate system, you would use something like Global Map or any other platform that could take it into a local coordinate system. Um, in the future, we can uh, build in, without too much hassle, a, uh, an ODGB or whatever database that includes all the major coordinate systems in the world. That is possible. But for now, you know, we wanted to get something out and released uh, this summer, so we just went with uh, UTMW84. Um, where do we get some of the sweet geolytic swag? Um, uh, Forrest, I can send you one. Um, that's, that's no problem. I can even have a baseball cap made. It's pretty easy. <laughs> um, okay, does it do GIS for centerline pipe export? Yes, it does. So, so you'd be able to export um, DXF files um, directly from the platform. And those DXF files, as I said, are depth, position, obviously depth, and color uh, accurate. Uh, Ryan, how does the platform deal with uh, systems that have multiple frequency antennas such as impulse radar? It works really well. Uh, I don't know if this data set here, oh, I've only included one. Okay, so I'm sorry, I only have, I've, I've deleted one. But what it does is it takes, uh, it takes the two frequencies and splits them up. So it'll actually give you the two frequencies and you can then decide to kill one frequency or move them into different folders and do what you need to do with it. So, and that's the same thing with uh, multiple polarities. Uh, so it will identify which polarity is which, and you can uh, select those files and move them into their own folder. What we found is that for the most part, you know, the data looks best on one polarity or one frequency. So we ended up just kind of muting the other folder, but they're both there and the system recognizes all of that. Hey Tom, uh, not sure if this was asked as I missed it. Uh, oh, okay, waiting for the question. And, and just be aware there's a 15 second delay from when you, uh, when you write to when I can see it on, online. Can we add topo? So right now the only topo that it's recognizing is whatever's built into the, the GPS source file and it'll of course recognize that. 
The next step, and again, this is not a very complicated procedure, is to bring in your own topography. And we would have to agree on a, a, a common file format. I would suggest that we would bring in either a GeoTIFF or even a Surfer grid file. Everybody has some software that speaks Surfer, and it's a kind of universal uh, DEM um, uh, file format. So either that or a GeoTIFF, and what we would be able to do is bring that in as part of the assets and, and then say snap to topography. So all the traces would be pushed up to drape from that topographical surf uh, surface. And that's something that we can build in uh, relatively quickly. So if you have a specific need, write to us, give us some sample files, and we'll start working on that, absolutely. Any other questions? Okay, if there aren't any other questions, then I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll stop this here. Oh, no, we do, Ryan. Hi there. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, well, unfortunately, I don't, I don't actually have a GPS. Well, I do here, but I'm, I don't know how accurate this GPS file was. Let's go ahead and look at this. So, so this was a data set actually from Saudi Arabia and we have it in here. So if I go, I should be able to do, uh, oh, I need to uh, apply a velocity here. So I'm just gonna guess at a velocity. And let's see if we can first show it as depth. Oh, there we go, and topography. So this was a data set taken with an RTK, and of course you all understand that RTK it either works really well or it doesn't work at all. And here's a really good example of where it didn't work. You can see that there's a general shape to this road and it's they've done a grid survey back and forth. Um, there's some topography for it, to it, but obviously it's not something we can use. So that's where the value of being able to bring in an external DEM would really be uh, important. And that's something that we can build very quickly. Uh, okay, send us by email. Under the asset tab, can you please explain the cell size and search radius? And the, okay, sure, yeah, absolutely. So this comes down to geostatistics, right? And we don't want to get into, I mean, that you can do a PhD in geostatistics, but the cell size, uh, let's go back to our, our original project here and assets slices. So our cell size is determined by two factors, right? And GPR is a little difficult when it comes to geostatistics because we have very fine spacing in one dimension and then very coarse spacing in another. So what I generally do, and, and it's not a rule of thumb at all, it's a somewhat experimentation, is that I, I look at our, our line separation and I generally do something about a cell size of about half to a quarter of our coarsest line separation. So in this case, it was it was an American data set, so it was one foot apart, so I put the cell size as 0.5. Now I can change that right now to 0.25, and there'll be twice as many cells, um, which is good. It takes maybe a few extra seconds to compute, but generally you'll have a slightly higher resolution, but there's a limit to that, of course. If you had uh, lines every five centimeters in one direction, and then uh, your next profile was one meter over, just creating a cell size of five centimeters is never going to work. That's like watching CSI and then go, when they go enhance, enhance. It's not like it's going to create new data, right? All you're doing is stretching things out. So generally, my rule of thumb, and, and others may disagree, um, is that I go with about one half to one quarter of the, of the coarsest dimension, right? So in this case, it was, say, uh, 0.25. So here we go. We've already stretched it out. And... Yeah, I, I guess we could, I don't know what it looked like before. It looks a little bit clearer right now. So uh, 0.25 seems to work. In terms of search radius, well, um, that's again, it's, it's open to discussion there. Generally, what, what I'm trying to do is, is do about twice the, the coarsest step, step size. So again, we have uh, you know one foot um, line spacing on this data set. So I went with two feet. Does it really matter that much? Not a huge amount. In fact, let's, you know, you can play with this and see what the difference is. So let's go ahead and do a one foot uh, line spacing. And, and if there's some gaps in the data, they might show up now, right? Because it's not going to interpolate through it. But um, it doesn't make a huge difference. In fact, one might argue that this little pipe here is a little bit clearer. Okay, from David Campo, can we pick a surface for amplitude analysis? Yes, of course. 
Um, sure. Well, let's do it that way. Um, well, this is the next. <laughs> okay, we're going to skip ahead here and just I'm kind of cheating here. So this is setting up for the next um, next webinar. But I like the status set because it has um, surfaces and it has all sorts of um, uh, rebar and all sorts of things. So let's go ahead and do a time zero correction on here. Okay. So what we have on this data set is some rebar, obviously all the way through, we have some pipes, but we have a surface. So what we can do is go ahead and interpret a surface. Uh, oh, I've already done that. So whoops, let me, let me delete that. And if I wanted to, I could go, let's add a surface and uh, horizon, confirm. And let's use our automatic surface finder. So we'll go like this. And oh, it goes up a little bit, so we want to redirect it, and it's pretty close. I can go ahead and accept that and then edit it if I wanted to and straighten it out here. I mean, we could be really careful here and zoom in, uh, but you get the idea. So now we can output a surface map. You can see I've started building it here. Uh, let's go to the next line here and do the same thing just to show you that it does work. And uh, I, will, I will edit that a little bit more. I'm not being very careful here, but you get the idea. Okay, and you can see here that we're building up our surface map. We can then go to our assets tool and we can build a surface, oops, <laughs> surface map, our surface depth, I guess, right? And that'll be a type and depth grid and it'll go ahead and create that grid for us. But what else we can do related to your question is that we can also create an amplitude grid. So, and that's really important. So we can say amplitude of surface and it'll be an amplitude grid and we can build that as well. Now it's not gonna work very well because we only have two lines, but yes, the answer is yes, you can. Uh, are there picking model, uh, pricing models for companies versus per user? So for example, uh, a license that can be used by one, two or three users. So no, there currently isn't, but if that becomes a need, let's talk about that. You know, we, we are uh, open to suggestion. We haven't, we haven't really thought that through in terms of what if a large company wants to buy 10 licenses. Yeah, for sure, let's, let's have a discussion about that. So uh, the answer is not currently, but we're certainly open to suggestion. Uh, give us some ideas on how to implement that, Ryan. Other questions? Okay, if there aren't any other questions, by all means, again, uh, you know, please, please write to us at support uh, at geolytics.com or you can find me on LinkedIn or, or anywhere else. Uh, we have a very good team behind us and uh, anything that you need implemented, we're happy to do very quickly. So I, again, thank you. I don't think there's any more questions. Thank you so much for attending, guys. I, I realize your time's very valuable and you've given us an hour of your time. I, the, the plan is that we're going to want to hold another, <laughs> you're welcome, Forrest. Uh, we're gonna hold another webinar in the next three weeks. And well, I've already cheated, I've shown you some of the data that we're gonna be working on, but the idea there is to look at uh, rebar depth. So actually create a depth surface of rebar, but also rebar reflection strength map. Uh, uh, map out all those surfaces and be able to give you a, a, a surface map as well as the strength of those reflections for Daniel and then find the pipes that were underneath and do all that uh, very, very quickly. So again, thank you so much for attending and I appreciate your time.